Thanks, Ali. Um, I'm not actually an advisor to the Zcash company in any formal capacity, but I am a board member of the Zcash Foundation. Uh, this is the Governance Day talk, so <laughs> take of that what you will. <laughs> um, so today I'm going to talk, uh, continue by my lectures from yesterday. Yesterday I hopefully gave you a little bit of a sense of how we think about regulation in this space. It's not. It's not as if you know, a Congress passes a law, Bitcoin is regulated now. It's more like Bitcoin emerges in the world and happens to fit, or persons using Bitcoin suddenly happen to fit within certain existing regulatory bundles. Like, I thought I was just using Bitcoin uh, and building a little business around Bitcoin, but actually I was doing money transmission as it's defined in uh, 18 out of the 53 states and territories in the U.S. that regulate money transmission and have a definition that would be amenable to applying to my activities. And it's literally that complicated. So yesterday we went through uh, three general ideas of where there's regulation. These are the big ones. There's also other regulatory issues like tax that I'm not going to touch because I'm not a tax attorney. Um, and there's other issues like commodities, futures trading, and things like that. The three big ones that I do want to cover because they keep coming up whenever we at Coin Center go and do education with people in Congress or with agencies are financial surveillance, by which I mean anti-money laundering, anti-terrorist financing, that kind of thing. And we covered that in the first lecture, which are uh, going to be available as videos online. Um, consumer protection, which I covered briefly, speaking almost exclusively uh, about business licensing. Uh, and this is uh, something that we see as a consumer protective measure in most countries. We see it happening in the US and already being directly applied to Bitcoin in the form of the bit license or in the form of state money transmission licenses, the kinds of things that PayPal or Venmo need to get in every state where they have customers. When the state regulator says, oh yeah, and if you're transmitting Bitcoin, you also need a license. But transmitting really means running a business that transmits, like Coinbase or Zappo. Shouldn't mean being an individual who's just holding or transferring Bitcoin for themselves. Shouldn't mean running a full node, a minor, an intermediary node on a payment channel. We need a better name for that set of activities. Non-custodial activities should be excluded, but it's by no means clear that they're excluded. Because as I said, the law is old, the technology is new, certain activities with the technology fit into the old laws, so that's this whole uncovering process that needs to happen. And then the third category, uh, general category of regulation that I'm talking about is what I'm talking about today, which is investor protection or securities regulation. And I'm going to talk a little bit about decentralized governance because that's actually quite relevant to the securities conversation. And this is Governance Day here at Technion. So why securities laws and cryptocurrencies? A few reasons. First, securities laws are heavy duty regulation. We're not talking about something that would have modest penalties if you didn't comply or something that's enforced ex ante, like people are free to do whatever they want, and if, if in the process they do something a little bit wrong, um, we come after them. <laughs> if somebody does something a little bit wrong, we come after them. No, no I'm sorry. <laughs> I, we're talking about serious penalties, and you're not even allowed to do it until you get permission. So it's heavy duty regulation. It's seek permission, not forgiveness regulation, because if you try and seek forgiveness, you're going to get slammed with massive penalties. And what I mean by this is that the Securities and Exchange Commission, and formalize the logic here, is not the New York Taxi and Limousine Commission. Therefore, running a cryptocurrency, especially maybe selling it to the public before the network even launches, is not the same as being Uber. You can't necessarily just hope to do it and hope that regulators will just kind of fade away into the background because your users love you so much that they'll vote people out if they try to enforce the uh, monopolistic taxi laws. No, it's a little, uh, there's an inequalities here. Next, oh, all those came at once, that's a shame. Well, don't get confused. Um, ICOs, token sales, and pre-sales May, be subject, may subject developers or other parties to securities regulation. Several scams, um, I don't need to list them all here. Many of you are probably aware of many of them, uh, have already drawn attention to this area. I will discuss one that is my personal bugaboo, PayPal. Um, 
Several vocal pundits have already suggested that possibly all token and crypto crowd sales, maybe even all cryptocurrencies, including the original Bitcoin, are actually securities because of the way that they basically create a community of shared value and allow people to hold a pro rata division of that shared value. And so this is an issue. This is my big one and Coin Center's big one. Um, I, I, we're not going to censor people who are making these claims, but we want to make sure we make equally loud claims that not all of these things are actually good fits for securities regulation. Neither good fits in the law, in other words, the law probably doesn't, as reasonably interpreted, cover a lot of things, like Bitcoin, for example, and not a good fit for public policy. It would not benefit Bitcoin users or moms and pops who bought Bitcoin for Bitcoin to be regulated as a security. And why U.S. security laws? I know my talks have been very uh, U.S. centric, but there's a very good reason in the securities context, and it's a few reasons, actually. One, if you, you are having a token sale, you're going to sell some tokens of a new network that you've created. If you have any U.S. purchasers, and that's U.S. residents, not citizens, this U.S. residents, you are subject to U.S. securities laws. You might say, well, F the police, I'm going to hide in the Horn of Africa. Have fun with that. If you live in most of the civilized world, you will be extradited if the SEC wants you extradited. These are really serious crimes, again. U.S. securities laws are the most broadly applied of all international securities laws. So while many things don't fit in to being classified as a security in, say, Israeli securities laws or uh, uh, European Union securities laws or UK securities laws, a lot of things that don't fit in there explicitly definitely fit in there in the US. Um, in other jurisdictions, there's generally an enumerated list of what arrangements constitute a security. The regulator actually has to come out one day and say, from this day forward, ICOs will be securities and be regulated as such. In the US, the regulator never has to come out and do that. And there's a reason for that, which I'll get to. It already potentially is a security, even if the regulator's been silent. Other jurisdictions may take their lead from the SEC, and we are actually seeing this unfold in real time. Someone should write a pretty good law review article about it. I immediately in the wake of the Securities and Exchange Commission's report on the Dow, um, we saw securities regulators all over the world, uh, most recently the UK's Financial Conduct Authority, but also the securities regulators in China, in Europe, in Russia, all over the place, suddenly say, okay, yep, yep, some ICOs are securities, basically echoing exactly what the SEC said in their Dow report. Now, the law review article would go something like this. People often criticize the rest of the world, or criticize the US, rather, for not having this nice enumerated list of what is and is not a security. Um, and the rest of the world has this very clear structure where we know when things will be regulated as securities because the regulator comes out and says so. But what actually happens in practice is the SEC has a flexible test which they will eventually apply whenever they want to to the thing they want to regulate. And then, because the US is in this sense a laboratory for securities regulation where you have this flexible test, then every other uh, nation basically carbon copies whatever the SEC said in their enforcement action or in their report or things like that by adding whatever they were talking about to their enumerated list. Because I think that's kind of what's happening. This um, bullet was here in this presentation the last time I gave it, which was actually a DevCon in 2016, Ethereum's DevCon. I said, the US Securities Exchange Commission is already investigating Paycoin. The Dow got the attention of some staff. Um, we have done educational outreach to the SEC about the Dow at their request and had some very fruitful conversations. That's now outdated because, of course, the SEC has now charged Josh Garza of Paycoin with securities fraud and released a report explaining how the Dow was, in fact, a security. So why are securities laws broadly applied? I hinted at this with that flexible test I was talking about. The definition of securities in the Securities Act, um, the act from the 1930s that actually sets up this whole regulatory structure in the US, 
It includes an undefined term, investment contract. So it says things like the following are securities, uh, certificates of common ownership in a, in a public corporation, things like that. That's obviously security. But also things that are securities includes investment contract. And then you can look through the rest of the statute and say, okay, where did they define investment contract? Oh, they didn't. Um, which means you either need a plain language interpretation of what things are investment contracts versus not investment contracts. Like I signed a, I signed a contract when I bought my house. Was that an investment contract? Is it, if this is a timeshare. Was that an investment contract? No, I want the house. I want to live in the house. But plenty of people do buy real estate for investment purposes. So we need to have some sort of clearer thing than the plain language interpretation, because the plain language interpretation could simultaneously cover everything and nothing, basically. And so the term has then been defined case by case by the federal courts as a flexible multi-part test. So you've got to meet all of these prongs in this test before you're considered someone who's selling a security. And courts have sought to ensure that this test, that the definition, which is defined by this test, is inclusive to reach, and this is a quote from the uh, key case on the subject, the countless and variable schemes devised by those who seek the use of the money of others for the promise of profit. I mean, just read that and think about the ICO space. And the primary case where that quote comes from is the SEC versus W.J. Howey. And from that case, we get the Howey test for security. How many people were here yesterday when Jonathan gave his presentation on securities law? OK, so good. For a lot of you, this is review. Hopefully, it's not too boring. And hopefully, it's just reinforcing. And is anybody who didn't raise their hand confused? I, I, one. Actually, I'm, I'm happy to answer a question or elaborate on anything. Right, so, so this is not the test, fortunately. <laughs> this is the public policy rationale for having a broad test. We want a broad test because we want to cover the countless and variable schemes. And I'm gonna show you the test next. The test comes from this Howey case. The Howey case is about a guy who owned an orange grove. He owned an orange grove, and he would invite rich New Englanders down to Florida to visit his orange grove and stay in a fancy hotel that happened to be at the top of the hill above the orange grove. And then periodically the guests would take the air, and he'd walk with them slowly in a southern manner down the orange groves, and they'd remark in their uh, somewhat aggressive and forward uh, New England way, uh, this must be profitable, and he'd say, Actually, the orange groves are very profitable, and you're in luck, they're for sale. And then basically, he would sell you a tract of land in the orange grove. He didn't sell you a share of stock in his orange grove company. He'll sell you a tract of land on the grove itself. And then he'll say, I know, I know what you're saying. You can't take care of these oranges. You live in New England. I have a whole team here. You sign a contract with them. They will take care of the trees, they'll pick the fruit, they'll sell it at market, and I will give you, the owner of this land, your profits as they accrue. Now, of course, what's really going on here is not a real estate deal. This isn't someone investing in real estate or buying real estate to use it. They're investing in a common enterprise, Howie's Orange Groves, and they rely on Howie in order to take care of the orange groves, in order to find good buyers for the oranges, in order to deal with problems like a bad frost one winter. Because there was a bad frost one winter, and the orange grove wasn't profitable, and a lot of people were angry. And this is in part why the SEC went after W.J. Howey in this case. And from this case, which got appealed all the way up to the Supreme Court, because at the various different lower court levels in the US, you had people saying, wait a minute, why is the SEC getting involved in f fruit plantations? That's not your business. You regulate Wall Street, not Florida fruit plantations. And so the thing went back and forth. But by the time it made it up to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court said, actually, yes. This is exactly the sort of the countless and variable schemes devised by those who seek the use of the money of others on the promise of profits. That's what you did, W.J. Howey. And in order to make sure that all of these sorts of things are covered in our regulatory structure in the future, 
we're going to give the SEC a test um, which will be enforced to determine when something is an investment contract. And this is the, the actual four-part test spelled out very explicitly in the quotation from Howey. An investment contract for the purposes of the Securities Act means a contract, transaction, or scheme. So basically, like if, if there's no written contract, it doesn't matter. It's an economic relationship whereby a person invests his money, that's the first prong of the Howey test, in two, a common enterprise, second prong, and three, is led to expect profits, four, solely from the efforts of the promoter or a third party. And then this is actually very important too. This is um, what doesn't count in the test. It doesn't matter whether the shares in the enterprise are evidenced by formal certificates or merely by a nominal property-like interest in the physical assets employed in the enterprise. The nominal interest in the physical assets of Howie's enterprise were the pieces of land he sold off. When you bought that piece of land, you weren't just buying a piece of land, you were buying a share in his common enterprise, the Orange Grove. All right, does this make sense? Anyone lost now? Awesome. And, you know, this is a really fun assemblage of things now. Um, we've got beavers and chinchillas. And I think that's a mink. I'm not really good on my semi-aquatic mammals, but we've got two of them. That's kind of an interesting uh, correlation. Diamonds, worms, uh, gold golf courses, condominiums, uh, and orange groves. And this is here, and there are more. I got lazy and just started copying them for graphic effect. But there are more, and all of these things have something in common. They've all been sold as securities. Even though you think, who sells beavers as securities? This happened. <laughs> so there's an interview with Bob Davenport, the regional director of the SEC from the 1970s, that's just so darn good, I wanted to read you some of it. Um, I'm going to have to, you'll have to indulge me because I actually forgot to pull it up on my phone before the presentation. But it's, it's really just fantastic. Uh, dab in port. Feel free to talk amongst yourselves about ICOs, about your new plan for an ICO. That's a really Kathy Weaver Beaver, right? You can't make this stuff up. All right, here it comes. So I tweeted this not too long ago, and it got a lot of love on Twitter amongst the interesting group of people who sit on Twitter waiting for someone to post a bad idea ICO and then go, ha, ha, ha. Um, <laughs> we're going to get to that in a second. I, <laughs> you might, have you seen my slides before? <laughs> OK, OK, so th this is good. This will be hopefully a little bit of levity in the day. This is, this is um, Bob. Uh, the Beaver case was a case called SEC versus Weaver's Beaver Association. One defendant appealed to the US Supreme Court, which denied cert. A fellow in Salt Lake area started a company called Weaver's Beaver Association. They sold pairs of beaver all over the United States and in foreign countries. These were purportedly domesticated beaver. <laughs> You, I'm sorry, I just find beavers funny, I don't know. You would, you would buy a pair of beaver for several thousand dollars. I, this was the 70s, too. That's a lot of money. And these beaver would have little beavers called kits. The diminutive beaver is a kit. Then these little kits would grow up, and they'd have more kits, and you would end up with this large herd of beaver. The beaver were to be sold to other purchasers. They had a marketing arm where they would sell your pairs of beaver. They were going to be very popular next year because a tremendous demand for beaver pelts was coming in coats, beaver hats, everything. It's back in style. When were beaver, beaver skin hats last in style? It's like the 1700s, I think. Maybe even 1600s, I don't know. So they sold millions and millions of dollars of these beavers. Millions of dollars in the 70s for beavers. And you can raise them in your own backyard, but you, you, so you can take physical delivery of your beaver if you want to, just to be clear. We will let you take physical delivery of your beavers. But if, if you don't have the capabilities, we have beaver ranches all through the West. <laughs> this 
<laughs> it's like cowboys. Um, Montana, Wyoming, etc. So all these beaver ranches uh, have little pens for each beaver. They have nesting boxes, little swimming pools, and they're fed a special diet. We'll take care of your beaver for you uh, for $150 or $175 per beaver per year, on top of your um, $1,000 beaver purchase, I guess. Um, nobody could take care of a beaver. You can't put a beaver in a bathtub. The purchasers would have to leave the beaver on the ranches. What happened? was that all these beavers and their kits that were being sold to people could not be resold because the association was too busy selling their own beaver to take the time to sell your beavers. So these people ended up with a large number of beaver and they're paying all these ranching fees. It's a disaster. They really weren't selling domesticated beaver. Instead, they were actually flying the beaver down from Canada and purchasing them from trappers in Canada at approximately $20 a beaver. You bought a $1,000 beaver, and oh, and all its children, the kits. We forget about the kits. They'd fly them into Salt Lake, put tattoos on their back, uh, this is getting dark now, uh, in the web, and start selling them. They'd sell them for $3,000 a pair and up. Oh, this is even larger than the number before. Anyway, that's from Bob, who sued Weaver Beaver on behalf, well, at the SEC sued Weaver Beaver. He was the regional director in the West Coast where these beaver animal cases were happening. <laughs> So even things you don't think can be securities can be securities. And there are a lot of interesting scams out there. So just like the animal cases of security law circa 1970, and just like the Orange Grove case that gave rise to all of this, the ICO cases will probably be bananas as they unfold over the next um, five years. Who knows? And bananas is a hyperlink because I did want to play this video. I, do we have sound on this computer? You have to sing along. <laughs> do you think the sound works? It should work? I hope I don't deafen you all. Practically not a single blockchain app gains any real value. Whereas banana coin is capable banana of being a whole industry. A ladyfinger elite bananas production and delivery. This market is actively developing, but it is extremely conservative and sluggish. Many banana plantations are violating the rules of chemicals application. Don't and ever violate those rules. Banana coin is an eco-friendly project. It decentralizes business and moves it outside of the framework of traditional financial institutions. So high. Does it work? That's banana really great. Tokens linked to the export value of bananas. Oh, that's that is clear. <laughs> and become the banana coin token holders in yes. exchange for cash. The goal of banana coin is to quadruple the overseas export sales be huge. by the production capacities. The demand for banana is always on the uprise. Always. The market value of banana coin tokens will more than double within 18 months. Double value in 18 months. Hours. Bitcoin and Ethereum-based banana coin will lead to a wide recognition Is it Bitcoin-based? <laughs> Don't miss this important event in the crypto world, the <laughs> ICO. Oh my god, I just realized this is, this is live. This is about to have, I just advertised. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to lose my job and get sued by the SEC for presenting this. Oh, did it? Did it? No, I think that's when it began. Is it over? No, nobody buy any. <laughs> This is totally real. Yeah, you're like, am I being, am I being punked right now? How much a coin? Oh, well, that's super cheap. You could buy so many of those. It's like Ripple. Like, I want to buy a ton of Ripple. What's that? Yes. You wrote the banana coin white paper? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be making fun of you. <laughs> uh, and maybe the white paper is very well written, but at the same time, I think it might be a security. Hopefully you're not selling to people in the US. Well, this just got awkward. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we'll move on from bananas and go to my real enemy, <laughs> Paycoin. Uh, <laughs> is the Paycoin white paper person in the room? <laughs> No, that's Josh Garza. He's, 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 yeah. Um, who knows what Paycoin is? Oh, not so many. So 
the ICO boom is not really anything new. We've had altcoins for a long time. Uh, a lot of them, some of them have had real technological innovation, like becoming the silver to Bitcoin's gold. Um, that didn't get laughs. Maybe there's Litecoin fans in the room, I'm sorry. Um, or maybe just the, the, the beta testing space for Bitcoin uh, changes like it actually seems to have become. But anyway, others of them have had real no fundamental like thing behind them. They were just something um, that was a copy of Bitcoin or a copy of a copy of Bitcoin. Um, Dogecoin, of course, was one of the early ones. Uh, it was basically a fork of Litecoin, so just like Litecoin, but it had cool marketing around it and a fun community, actually. And it, it was decentralized. I don't think anybody got all that rich off of Dogecoin. Uh, maybe they did, I don't know. But they, uh, they sponsored a Jamaican bobsled team and they did amazing things like that. So I like Dogecoin. Paycoin came around back then. Paycoin was in 2000, uh, it, was, like it was discussed in 14 and, and, and made in 2015, I think, if I'm, I'm not getting that date wrong. And it was supposed to be a global currency that lets you send money to anyone, anywhere, anytime. Like Bitcoin, I guess. Um, and it's totally free, lightning fast, so maybe they've got a scaling solution, I don't know. And insanely easy, whether you're a person or a business. Um, now, this advertising's not terrible, because that just sounds like another cryptocurrency, and maybe they had real technological innovation. Um, but what's really going on here um, is more nefarious, because the guy behind Paycoin is a serial scam artist. Um, he defrauded the Massachusetts state government by promising to build high-speed internet access for them and then running away with the money. A really clean, <laughs> elegant scam, actually, compared to this stuff. And then, he, and then he started a cloud mining company called Geniuses at Work, or GAW Mines. And w what he had, apparently, was a warehouse, and he was going to fill his warehouse with mining rigs, and then, you know what cloud, does anyone know what cloud mining is? This is how it works. You then say, okay, people want to mine at home, but that's hard. So I'll mine for you uh, with machines. You buy a machine in my warehouse, and I'll give you a stream of the profits. It's the Howie case. It, it's true. It, it's, it's almost as hard. Did you say almost as hard as? It's not as hard as he's mining at home with nuclear away from I, I think that's probably true. Yeah, you don't have to put the thing in your bathtub. In fact, that'd be a bad idea with a mining rig. <laughs> you can still shower. Um, <laughs> so. Um, where was I? I've gotten the giggles and I've just lost the plot completely. Um, Paycoin. So he, 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 before, before Paycoin, he had the geniuses at work mining scam. He didn't have any miners in his warehouse. This was not actually cloud mining. And cloud mining might be a security scam anyway. But without the miners, you're just a Ponzi scam because you're just taking money from people and paying the early investors with the new money. So he was already being investigated by the SEC because he's a bad actor for the cloud mining scam. And then he creates this Paycoin thing in the process while he's being investigated. Uh, and Paycoin was, was guaranteed or, or rumored, but strong rumor, to have Amazon integration once the network launches, because he's in talks with Amazon to get it as a payment method. Uh, it was going to have a $20 uh, repurchase agreement. So if you were dissatisfied with your Paycoin, he'll buy it back from you at the high price of $20, because you're buying in now at 5 uh, and it also, it, it, it was a fork of peer coin, so it was one of the early proof of stake type uh, cryptocurrencies. Um, but there were uh, some changes to the code which were very interesting. Certain special stakers uh, earned supernatural profits uh, for staking as compared to your average staker. And those would be sold off um, for a slightly elevated price to some important people who wanted them, including um, Cryptsy, the uh, altcoin exchange at the time. And it's not perhaps coincidental that Cryptsy was the only altcoin exchange that listed Paycoin for a long period of time because they were also earning supernatural profits uh, from their staking uh, position. And Cryptsy, by the way, uh, was probably also a fraud or a scam. Uh, they're also an investigation and they've shut down long ago. So all in all, a really bad story. And, and, and hopefully it's just now clear why this is probably a security. If a beaver ranch is a security, when you're selling the beavers off, then Paycoin is a security. You're selling off nominal interests in your company's assets. The nominal interests are some of the finite number of Paycoin out there. And what you're promising people is that you're going to make them rich by them holding those nominal assets because you're going to make Paycoin super valuable, just like the beaver farmer is going to make that beaver pelt super valuable. So, in light of this, we were very worried that the SEC was already looking at him for the cloud mining um, scam. 
Coin Center was very worried, and that they might inevitably turn to the Paycoin scam. And when they did so, they might do something that would be bad for the whole cryptocurrency industry. They might say, cryptocurrencies are securities. Paycoin was a cryptocurrency, Paycoin was a security, all cryptocurrencies are securities. And that would be bad. Why? Because then it would put all kinds of regulatory barriers merely for the trading of Bitcoin. Bitcoin would only be able to be traded on the New York Stock Exchange, for example, or other registered securities exchanges. And there'd be all kinds of issues with building new innovative projects um, where you just wouldn't be able to sell them without doing a massive amount of compliance up front and investor disclosure up front. And maybe we want that, um, but I'll tell you, it would have, would have been very different than what Ethereum did. Um, and Ethereum was a true innovation, and I'm very glad Ethereum was able to launch without too much friction. So we wanted them the SEC, hopefully, to, when they go after Paycoin, to make a distinction. Certain things about what, what Garza did made Paycoin a security, though not all, not all cryptocurrencies, not all tokens necessarily are a security. And so we built this framework. It's still available on our website. We published it a while ago in January 2016, because as I said, this was before the ICO boom, but we were worried about this because of Paycoin and Bitcoin. Um, and we had some basic uh, mapping between aspects of the technology that, uh, between aspects of the technology and likelihood to qualify as securities. So closed source or low transparency cryptocurrencies are likely to be classified as securities. Why? Because without visibility into the source code, there's no reason to believe that the profits or the profitability or the usefulness of the thing come from anything other than the promoter's hype. Um, it's really not decentralized. It's not an open source technology. It's really just one person's thing that they're promising is going to be awesome. Open but heavily marketed pre-sales or sales of pre-mined cryptocurrencies when there's a small and non-diverse mining and developer community, when the facts indicate that profits come primarily from the efforts of this discrete and profit-motivated group. So if you sold a cryptocurrency and you only had like three developers and the developers owned 99% of the tokens, then they were selling off one. Or maybe that ratio goes down, but that's the ultimate evil there. Cryptocurrencies with permissioned ledgers or highly centralized community of transaction validators. Here, if there was a permissioned ledger with a token, and usually they don't want tokens, but if there was, there'd be a good case for it being a security. And then less likely to qualify as securities, highly decentralized cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin or Litecoin because they lack any commonality necessarily between the many people who are promoting it, because there's not just one promoter, there's all kinds of businesses and persons out there, and the actual value of the underlying asset. I explain this like this, like look, Bitfury could be profitable or it could go out of business, irrespective of the price of Bitcoin. So it's like a marketing coin? Yes, uh, you get like a big crowd of promoters, so that can be included as a non... Would that be something like that? Like, would it be to be sufficient? No, it's not sufficient that there just is a highly decentralized number of promoters if we're still relying on one or two of them to actually make the thing work. Now, there's a weird thing here in that what gives currency value is everybody together decides to use it as currency. So currency is actually kind of tough. Gold is kind of tough. It's like, yeah, we do actually rely on a bunch of people to create the price of gold, mostly gold speculators. But that doesn't make those gold speculators the issuers of gold. And gold is not, therefore, a security. It's a commodity. It's something that exists in the world. Um, anyway, I'm just uh, short on time. I'm going to go through these a little faster. Side-chain cryptocurrencies, this was back when sidechains were still talked about. I don't know if they still are being talked about. Or maybe a proof of burn cryptocurrency, or maybe an airdrop. I really like the idea of proof of burn, though, because you actually create economic costs for the person to become a member of the network, which means you're getting serious members who are less likely to try a 51% attack or screw with the governance or DDoS it. Um, that's good, but you don't get the money. You, you, you aren't taking money from people. You're just having them do an economically costly signal. Counterparty launched that way a long time ago, and I thought it was a cool idea. And there was another possibility that somebody 
Um, I won't say who because I don't want to. Um, I don't want to share his name because he decided not to do this, and I think he should have. But somebody once suggested to me that they could do a token sale by saying you can either burn Bitcoin or donate the Bitcoin to our development effort, to a foundation that would develop the, the new token you're getting. And I thought that was quite clever because then you, you actually, in a meaningfully way, attack the proposition that there's no contract. Uh, you, you attack the proposition that there is a contract, rather because you could have gotten the same bargained for deal, the token at the end of the day, by giving the person nothing as you could by giving the person something. So there's not exactly this normal exchange because you're just burning it. Or you could donate to the foundation. And most people probably would donate then because they believe in the thing. But you wouldn't always have to enrich the person. I don't know. I think that's clever. Anyway. Um, so utility tokens. Uh, and by utility tokens, I don't mean like the token gets you uh, a product offered by a company. I mean utility like it's an infrastructure utility, like electricity is a utility. And so by utility here, I mean things like smart contracting networks like Ethereum or maybe Filecoin, a network of decentralized storage uh, or SIA or storage. And, you know, Neha and I had a little argument about whether these things work, but we know what they're trying to build, and what they're trying to build does sound like an actual decentralized infrastructure, like an actual utility. So why would these things maybe not be securities? Maybe because we attack the expectation of profits relying on the efforts of others prong. We say there may be an expectation of profits here, but it's not the only motivator for purchase. People also purchase the tokens because they want to access the use value that the token gives them on a decentralized network, the actual infrastructure utility that the token gives them. They want to write smart contracts, and you can't write them without Ether because you need to pay for gas. They want to store files massively redundantly on millions of computers across the world. You'll need Filecoin or Siacoin or storage for that. And I'm going to go through these quickly. So token was purchased for its use value rather than profit expectation. The intuition here comes from a line of cases. So again, we go back to the old case law, like the orange groves and the beavers and things like that. Comes from a line of cases about condominiums, where people purchased a share of a co-op in New York City, which is a cooperative housing. Uh, it's really a share in a common enterprise. But because they were buying it to live in the housing, this was considered not a security by the courts. So this is a case where you see that the actual uh, desire to use the thing, even if there's also a desire to see your house go up in value, because we feel that way about our real estate, but because we also want to use the thing, we believe in the network, we believe in the, in the technology, we actually want to run smart contracts, we want to store files, it's saved from being a security, maybe just like condominiums are saved from being securities. Um, token was purchased after the application is already up and running. So maybe if these arguments don't hold water, Bitcoin's okay, because nobody purchased Bitcoins before the network launched. There was no pre-sale of Bitcoin. And maybe anybody who wanted to launch a crypto token could just make sure they actually have a working network before selling any tokens. Although then they'd have this whole discussion over what's really a working network versus a toy. But anyway. There's a line of cases here about country clubs, golf courses actually in the US, where people were selling memberships to a golf course that didn't exist yet. And they're like, oh yeah, it's gonna be a great country club. Dick Cheney's gonna golf there, it's gonna be awesome. You should buy now a membership for $50 because once the course is open and everybody wants to golf here, it's gonna be more like $200. Actually, I'm sure country clubs are much more expensive than that. I'm clearly not that kind of lawyer. Um, so, <laughs> Actually, you're right, so maybe it's a discount. <laughs> so so um, in these cases where you were pre-selling memberships to a golf course before you built it and using the, the money to actually build the golf course, security. You know, This is speculative venture. But in cases where the country club's already built and you're selling memberships, and maybe the memberships are even transferable, and maybe there's even kind of a secondary market for memberships, that's okay, because the golf course is built, people know that they can go golf at any time, this is the, you can take actual delivery of your beaver, but in golf case, you can golf anytime you can use it. Um, but but you, you actually can get value out of it, unlike the beaver, where you're not going to ever take delivery of the beaver, because no one's got time for that. Um, so 
The third thing here is where the token's value is dependent on the purchaser's own efforts and or the efforts of a large number of other unaffiliated investors, users, or developers. And so if the network's big enough, and I, I don't mean promoters, I don't mean people who are out there marketing for it, I mean like actual uh, GitHub commits. It's not all from one group. It's from a bunch of people all over the world. I mean actual consensus power. So it's not just a small group of people providing proofs of work on this thing. It's multiple unaffiliated entities. If it's really that decentralized, then it stops to look like a security for the same reason gold stops to look like a security, because there are lots of people, many different gold miners, people finding uses for gold in science, people finding uses for gold in jewelry, and they're all unaffiliated. It would be silly to call any one of them the promoter of gold and to call gold a security rather than what we know it is, this commodity, this thing that exists in the world and has value because the entire market gives it value, not just one person who you trust to give it value. Peter? Ah, yeah. On this utility token, I mean, isn't the problem, though, is that a small group of investors who, you know, get a, an ICO who get a large percentage, get a, get a large percentage of the tokens initially, their token is going to go up even though there's some utility value to that token? People who get a large percentage, their token's going to go up even though there is a utility? Meaning that the, these ICOs, the organizers of the ICO are setting aside a bunch for themselves, for yeah. Themselves, and then they're going to issue the yeah. uh, token. So they can say, yeah, there's a utility for the token. There's, a, there's an ICO that yeah. was a couple weeks ago called REP, real yeah. estate exchange. And you use the token so, to be able to get access to property. So I agree with you. That's a factor. Um, that's not determinative, but if the developers are hoarding a lot of it, then there's actually case law here. I didn't get into the specifics. There's a thing in the common enterprise prong of Howey called vertical commonality, and it says, are the profits of the people on top linked to the profits on the people on the bottom? And the more tokens the developer owns, basically, the more they would be benefited by an increase in the price, right? And so actually you fit the test better then, if that's the case. Um, versus a world where people all over the world have different Bitcoin holdings, some people contributing to the repository uh, or mining might have very little, some might have a lot. Their profits all move disjunctly and they all have different costs for whatever it is they're doing. But that vertical commonality test is a real test. So. Right, but none of these will be determinative, and that's the nature of a flexible test. I'm just giving you an answer as to what arguments a lawyer would make. And I'm not going to make them for anyone here because I'm not your lawyer, but these are the conversations that we're going to be having as we go bananas over the next five years. So, some things to avoid. Um, language. Um, language doesn't matter. Like, it's not going to save you if you don't use these words, but why would you use these words? Initial coin offering. It comes from initial... A public offering, and that's what the SEC regulates. It's a stupid name. It's too, it's too late for me to stop it. I, I said that a year ago at DevCon, and nobody listens. Um, profit sharing, pro rata, promised returns, etc. So, so when when Banana Coin's video, I'm sorry, I come back to Banana Coin, but when the video says the token's going to double in value in a year, that's exactly the kind of thing the SEC goes after time and time again, whether it's beavers and the next year's fashion trends or bananas and what people want to eat. Language that disclaims securities issuance. This does not work. In fact, it will backfire. If you say uh, this is not a security in your contract where people buy tokens from you and, and the tokens are classified as a security under the flexible test, it's just going to piss people off that you disclaimed the thing you were doing in the document where you were doing it. The test is based on the economic realities of the transaction, not about any formal language. So it doesn't matter if you call it a share or a stock or a certificate. If the economic realities are a common investment, it's going to be a security. And this is a really big one, endorsing risky ventures or claiming endorsements, because the DAO uh, was apparently a security, and a lot of people had their faces all over DAOHub.org. Um, and there's, there's really a vague definition of promoter. So if they wanted to go after anybody who's seen as endorsing, they kind of can. Uh, recent developments. 
Ali, how much time do I have in total? Okay. Recent developments. Um, the Swiss model, the stiff tongue, which is used by most of the um, people selling tokens these days, making no judgment on whether all of those people using a stiff tongue or not are securities. I don't know, but this is something that's happening. The SEC's Dow investigative report, Reg D Rule 506 sales and SAFT sales. I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. Welcome to Switzerland, home of uh, elaborately complicated knives, uh, the Europe's uh, most steep furnicular, and the stiff tongue. I was going to find an image for stiff tongues, but it was all just not work appropriate. So, Switzerland. What is a stiff tongue? Right, and from what I understand, um, it has this kind of more aggressive uh, governance structure than a, than a U.S. nonprofit, where this, the purpose of the nonprofit has to be spelled out really narrowly, and then there's very strict penalties if it ever deviates from that purpose. And so, from what I understand, the reason why this has been an appealing um, entity to receive the funds from a token sale is because you can say in the charter for the stiff tongue, this is to be used to support an open, decentralized technology. It is not going to go to any one for-profit entity. It is really here held in trust to develop what is a public good, what is maybe ultimately going to be a commodity in the world, like Bitcoin became a commodity in the world that has usefulness and makes our lives better. And so people have gone to Switzerland, uh, gone to lawyers in Switzerland, most, most prominently MME, um, and ask them to set up these foundations that have these narrow purposes. And those foundations are the ones that end up receiving the funds in a, in a token sale. And then people get tokens, hopefully, once the stiff tongue is able to find people in the world, other companies or developers or whatever, that will actually build the network that will have tokens. And it's even stated in these agreements with the stiff tongue that you're not promised anything. You're making a donation to some sort of larger cause the desire to have whatever the stiff tongue wants to build. And you'll probably get tokens in the Genesis block once the stiff tongue builds the Genesis block. And they're not even going to build it. They're the, the fiduciary that helps the world build it. I don't feel too comfortable with this. Uh, granted, this is what, in many ways, Ethereum did. Um, my feeling is that the biggest problem with this is, is some people claim that when you made that contract with the stiff tongue, it wasn't really a contract. You were making a donation, and you expected nothing in return. And the problem I have with this is everybody who gives money to a stiff tongue expects things in return. Do we have to stop? Yes. OK. Um, can I, like, one minute? Yeah. So then there's the Dow investigative report, which basically said that the, the Dow was a security. You heard about this a little bit yesterday. Um, one thing I want to point out is that this one, at the time of the DAO's launch, the DAO website identified 11 high-profile individuals. I made that a hyperlink to archive, if that loads. Anyway, we don't have time. Um, it was basically everyone involved with Ethereum, which is really alarming to me, because I love Ethereum. And this report says that any of those people have violated securities laws. And this report also says that they're not going to come after anybody in the space. And that's good. I'm glad. But that makes me very concerned for everybody who I think is doing awesome work in the space. And then finally, there are these new things that sell only to accredited investors in the US. Um, Filecoin is an example. Uh, blockchain capital is an example. And they take advantage of a safe harbor called 506C in Reg D. And it means they only sell to people who have over a million dollars in net worth or $200,000 in provable income for the last two years. Um, these still have open questions, but they're, more, uh, they're less risky approaches, I'd say. The, the big open question is that the, so that gets you out of securities regulation because you only sold to rich people and we don't worry about their bad decisions as much. Um, the residual question, though, is those people can't sell their things after a year. What happens after a year? In Filecoin, in theory, after a year, they're not going to sell their promise of future tokens, they're going to sell tokens. And by then, the tokens will have a real utility and will no longer be securities. Blockchain capital, the token's always supposed to be part of a venture fund, a share of a venture fund. So after a year, when the accredited investors decide to sell their blockchain capital tokens on open markets, does that mean 
we've just completely done an end run around all securities laws because now they can sell them to non-accredited investors? That's a huge question because the SEC is probably not going to like that. Uh, I, I don't know, but we'll see. And in conclusion, uh, the SEC is kind of cleaving the earth in two. And everything on that earth divided loosely into what it is and how it works will fall on one side or the other. And we'll just see. Sorry for going over.